insightful podcasts by informative hosts. Insights into Things, a podcast network. Welcome to Insights into Tomorrow, where we take a deeper look into how the issues of today will impact the world of tomorrow, from politics and world news to media and technology. We discuss how today's headlines are becoming tomorrow's reality. Welcome to Insights into Tomorrow. This is episode 15, Battleground Afghanistan. I'm your host, Joseph Whalen, and my co-host, Sam Whalen. Hello, everybody. How you doing today, Sam? Doing okay. <clears throat> Anything exciting going on? Not much. Just uh, prepping for the school year, getting back in the swing of things. Uh, you know, just counting down the days. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Days until you start or days until it's over? Yes. <laughs> So today we are talking about one that's pulled directly from the headlines, and that is what's going on in Afghanistan. So after 20 years of military operations, over $2 trillion spent, an estimated 160,000 lives, which include 50,000 of which were civilian, 2,445 American service members, <clears throat> almost 4,000 U.S. contractors, and over 60,000 Afghan national military police. There was also almost 1,200 allied service members, 44 aid workers, and 72 journalists. And that doesn't even count the 50,000 Taliban and other opposition fighters. The United States is finally pulling out of Afghanistan. <clears throat> While that's an exceedingly high toll, to pay for America's longest war ever, those numbers are just a fraction of what the long-term consequences will cost. In today's episode, we're going to take a look at the long war in Afghanistan, the history surrounding the disputed country, how we got there, what went wrong, and what the future holds for the country, the region, and the world as a result of what happened there. But before we do that, I would invite our Audience, both our listening and our viewing audience, do subscribe to the podcast. <clears throat> you can get audio versions of this podcast listed as Insights into Tomorrow. Video versions of this and all of the network's podcasts can be found listed as Insights into Things. We're available anywhere you can get a podcast, Apple, Spotify, Google, Stitcher, and so forth. I would also invite our uh, audience to write in, give us some feedback, give us some topics you'd like us to talk about, tell us how we're doing. You can email us at comments at insightsintothings.com. You can find us on Twitter at insights underscore things. We're on Facebook at facebook.com slash insights into things podcast or Instagram at insights into things where you can get links to all those on our website at www.insightsintothings.com. Ready to get started? Yes, sir. All right. <music> Never get involved in a land war in Asia. The phrase has been attributed to several sources, including British General Bernard Montgomery and American General Dwight Eisenhower. It was even a popular phrase from the cult classic The Princess Bride as kind of a joke. But it was Douglas MacArthur offering it to President Kennedy in a private meeting the two had at the Waldorf Astoria in New York in April of 1961 that really rings true. Today, the phrase has, come, has become part of our popular vernacular as a warning to avoid starting the conflict that's too large or onerous for you to properly resolve it or to achieve victory. It's an expensive lesson the French learned in Vietnam, a lesson the United States had to relearn during more than a decade in the country, same country, continuing that conflict. It's a lesson the Russians learned during what was termed their own Vietnam in Afghanistan between 1979 and 89. But again, a lesson the United States seemed to fail to heed and wound up getting itself 
into and having to learn on its own. We're talking, of course, about the 20 plus years that the United States has spent embroiled in the war on terror, as it's been called, in Afghanistan, that we're now pulling out of with what can generously be described as disastrous consequences for the country. Why is it that the United States seems incapable of learning from other countries' mistakes and so intent on blundering into themselves? Is it arrogance? Is it pride? Does the United States think that we can somehow be successful where other countries <clears throat> have had dismal failures? What do you think? I do think. I think it's a combination of all three of those things. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, I think that America, especially when it comes to our military, we are extremely confident. And I think that we have the desire to make that confidence known throughout the world. And I definitely think that this is a symptom of that or, a, I guess, a result of that confidence and that, that overextension. Absolutely. Yeah, and it's it's funny you mention that because when we were going into, or when we were coming out of, I should say, World War II, we had that same level of confidence that we could do anything, and then we wound up getting mired down in in the Korean conflict, you know, where we were using the same techniques, the same tactics, and so forth, and that led us into blundering into Vietnam, where we thought we owned the world, and we really got a lesson out of that, and, and by the time we got out of Vietnam in the 1970s, there was a lot of lack of confidence in our military. We wound up building it up through the 70s and 80s, and in the 90s, we decided to flex our muscle again in the Middle East. So it, it seems to be kind of a recurring theme for us. Is there a way to, to stop this cycle of um, violence and, and waste? I mean, people always say history repeats itself, right? I don't want to I'm repeating myself by saying that. I'm sure I've said that on the show before. But I think a, some way to at least start is to, which we'll probably do here today, is to make those parallels between something in the modern world, like what's going on in Afghanistan, with something like Vietnam. And when you look at how similar these things are, there's lessons to be learned from that of what not to do. And if we can remember 30 or 40 years from now, when we might find ourselves in a conflict like that again, maybe we can avoid you know getting stuck in the mud again yeah and i'm a <clears throat> i've always been a fan of it's better to learn lessons from other people's mistakes than your own and avoid making those mistakes unfortunately our country doesn't seem to look at it from that perspective they look at other people's mistakes and somehow think that they can do it differently the challenge yeah i i I guess that's a valid point. Yeah, I think that ties into the – we were just talking about it, but the pride and the arrogance. I think it's – we tend to see ourselves as infallible, especially when it comes to the global stage like this. And I think that we've proven at least twice now that we are not infallible. Right. Well, and we also assume that the entire world should live the way that we live, mm -hmm. that our policies and our politics and – Our culture too. Our culture and our morals and mm -hmm. it, it doesn't doesn't work that way. So – but let's talk about how we got here, where we are today. So the United States' most recent involvement in Afghanistan was a product of the War on Terror, uh, which itself was a response to the September 11th terrorist attacks on the United States. Uh, it is impossible to address this subject without talking about those attacks and ensuring that the War on Terror that followed. Uh, for many of us, the events of September 11th are burned into our memory. Uh, not me. I was only one years old at the time, but for <laughs> I'm sure many of our listening audience, that's, that's true. All the documentaries that will be coming exactly. out, I'm sure it will burn in. Yeah. Uh, but for comparative purposes, we need to talk about some of the details of those events. Uh, so four California-bound jumbo jets originating from three different airports across the eastern United States uh, were hijacked mid-flight by a total of 19 Al-Qaeda terrorists. Fifteen of the terrorists were citizens of Saudi Arabia. Two were from the United Arab Emirates. Emirates, sorry. One was from Lebanon, one was from Egypt. That's going to be important shortly. <laughs> it's worth noting none of the terrorists originated in any of the countries targeted in the war on terror. And I think that, that is extremely important to remember, especially when we look at the course of history that followed September Absolutely. 11th attacks. American Airlines Flight 11 and United Airlines Flight 175 targeted the Twin Towers of the World Trade Center in Manhattan, New York. American Airlines Flight 77 hit the Pentagon. United Airlines Flight 93 crashed in route to its intended target, which was supposed to be the White House or another uh, D.C. building. When passengers on the plane, alerted by cell phone of the other hijackings, uh, were brave enough to step up and stop the attackers and uh, crash the plane. 
In total, 2,996 lives were lost, including the 19 hijackers. More than 25,000 are estimated to have been injured. So that's another interesting <clears throat> statistic, just those numbers alone. So just shy of 3,000 lives were lost in that attack. And if we take a look back at the numbers we threw out at the beginning uh, of the show here of the number of American servicemen. So we had almost that number of servicemen killed in Afghanistan alone. <clears throat> we had more than that number, almost 4,000 U.S. contractors killed. So the death toll of Americans who died in Afghanistan now almost doubles what the death toll was during the attacks on 9-11. Does that have any resonance with, with you? <clears throat> well, I think I think when we're looking at these numbers, they can get lost in the weeds very easily. I think personally, it's when you look at these statistics, it kind of desensitizes you to the loss of life in general. I think if even one life was lost, that's a problem. Sure. Um, <clears throat> but I think that it's it's difficult to compare because the the nine eleven attacks were these people were seemingly randomly just taken out, you know, out of nowhere. Whereas we're comparing the lives of soldiers that are, they know what they're stepping up for and they know the, the risk of what they're uh, uh, vo volunteering. Is that the right word? I guess just signing up for in general. Sure. Yeah. Their enlistment. Yeah. So, and they have that duty that they want to protect. I mean, you look into the civilians that were killed. They also had no idea what was going to happen to them. But it's it's difficult to even fathom those numbers from, you know, 3,000 to 50,000. Yeah. I think you make a valid point. You know, our military, when you when you enlist in the military, there's a certain assumption that there's a risk you're taking on yourself. Uh, I think our government should be first and foremost looking to mitigate that risk as Absolutely. much as possible. Mm -hmm. And I think for the most part they do. We don't I don't think we lightheartedly put our troops in danger um, or or do it in situations where it can't be warranted or justified, mm -hmm. but the number of dead that, that happened in Afghanistan is still a staggering number compared yep. to 9-11 and our response. You know, that's that was our response to 9-11. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so on September 16th, 2001, then President Bush, uh, George W. Bush, coined the phrase War on Terror to describe the United States' response to the terrorist attacks on the United States. This includes the following. Targeted strikes against al-Qaeda insurgency in Yemen, which the United States had been involved with already since 1998. American-led, quote, intervention in Afghanistan, which started in 2001. The Iraq conflict, which started in 2003 on, do, at best, dubious evidence of of terroristic activity as well as the pursuit of osama bin laden into pakistan starting in 2004 on may 23rd 2013 then president barack obama announced that the global war on terror was over saying u.s military and intelligence will not wage war against a tactic but will instead focus on a group a specific group of networks determined to destroy the u.s so that's great. 2013, the war on terror is over. Everybody can come home, right? No. On December 28, 2014, the Obama administration announced an end of the combat role of the U.S.-led mission in Afghanistan, despite the fact that the U.S. continued to play a major role in the war on Afghanistan. I think we're giving a little bit of lip service there to try mm -hmm. to get some votes, maybe. Mm -hmm. Then in 2017, President Trump significantly expanded the military presence in Afghanistan after the war on terror was over and our military mission in Afghanistan was over. We're sending more troops back in 2017. I'm thinking the messaging here that we're getting really is kind of inconsistent with the reality here. What are your thoughts? Yeah, definitely. I think that the this war on terror has been used as a political uh, tactics since it started, right? So you had President Bush, uh, Bush Jr. on the American battleship with the with mission, mission accomplished. accomplished yeah. There was that. There's what we were talking about here with Obama. Um, it's always a, if we can end the war on terror, right? That's a way to get bonus points with the people. And I think that that's really all it is. That's It's never sincere, right? And I know we talk about politicians and they make some insincere claims all the time. And I think that this is just a prime example of that. 
Yeah, I think I think the problem that we run into is every politician wants to be known for winning a war but not fighting a war. Mm-hmm. Because when you fight a war, it's dirty. Lives are lost. It costs a lot of money. There's a lot of carnage. You get a lot of bad press when bombs are going off and, and civilians are dying and American troops are dying. But when the war is over, and I think this was the kind of the product of the, of the Gulf War in the 90s. You know, it lasted – so short a period of time and was such a resounding victory for the United States that George Bush, the first Bush's presidency skyrocketed in popularity Mm -hmm. after that. Of course it didn't help him win reelection, but everyone wanted to get that jump in popularity. So everybody wants to declare this war is over. I don't, I don't think you can really do that in the middle of a war if you still have troops on the ground, still fighting, still dying, still, you know, bullets flying. Yeah, and something – and jump in here if I'm misspoken here, but the war on terror wasn't a declared war, right? So they didn't have to go to Congress there or anything was, like that? Right. That it, gives them a lot of options for how they want to wage this war. Right. So that's yeah, just something to think The war on terror was literally just a marketing term. Yeah. Um, that was also when we got our axis of evil terminology mm-hmm. as well and – you know, we didn't because we didn't declare war on a country, which is what Congress is authorized to do. We pretty much had carte blanche to do whatever you want to do whatever you want. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> so that's kind of uh, talking about why we got here. Sort of. Uh, we're going to take a little break. We're going to come back, and we're going to talk a little bit about the withdrawal from Afghanistan. We'll be right back. <laughs> Insights into Teens, a podcast series exploring the issues and challenges of today's youth. Talking to real teens about real teen problems. Explore issues from braces to puberty, social anxiety to financial responsibility. Each week, we talk about the topics concerning today's youth. We look at how the issues affect teens, how to cope with these issues, and how parents, friends, and loved ones can help teens handle these challenges. Check out our video episodes on youtube.com backslash insights into things. Catch our audio versions on podcast.insightsintoteens.com on the web at insightsintothings.com. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Insights Into Tomorrow. Uh, We are talking about the withdrawal from Afghanistan. Uh, In the first segment, we talked a little bit about the past, and now we're dealing with more uh, present topics. Um, So on April 14th, 2021, President Biden announced the full U.S. troop withdrawal from Afghanistan by September the 11th this year, which would be the 20th anniversary of the September 11th attacks. Uh, President Joe Biden said the war in Afghanistan was never meant to be multi-generational, as he officially announced the uh, drawdown of all remaining 2,500 U.S. troops uh, beginning May the 1st and, like we said, concluding on September the 11th. The president noted that only the citizens of Afghanistan have the right and responsibility to lead their country. This announcement was made after consulting with, quote, our allies and partners, with our military leaders and intelligence personnel, with our diplomats and our development experts, with the Congress and the vice president, as well as with President uh, Afghan President Ashraf Ghani, I'm probably mispronouncing that, and many other uh, around the world. The United States met its objective 10 years ago with the assassination of al-Qaeda leader Osama bin Laden. Biden added, quote, our reasons for staying have become increasingly unclear. Uh, which is a little too self-aware, I think, for president. But uh, it's worth noting the Bin Laden or Bin Laden was killed during the presidency of Barack Obama, during which Biden was uh, the vice president at the time. More than two years passed during the Obama administration after Bin Laden's death, in which the objectives in Afghanistan were not clarified, uh, nor was a planned withdrawal put in place. Biden notes in his remarks that over the past 20 years, quote, the terrorist threat has become more dispersed, metastasizing around the globe. It could be argued that this was a direct result of the U.S. effort to wage a conventional-style war against nation-states when their true enemy deployed asymmetric uh, guerrilla warfare tactics, much like in Vietnam. It's important to note that while still in office, Donald Trump negotiated a deal with the Taliban to withdraw U.S. military personnel. 
The deal was done without the participation of the current Afghan government and without their consent. It promised a U.S. withdrawal by May 1st, 2021. This agreement was still in effect when Joe Biden revised the timeline to September the 11th and when he started the pullout in August. So it's more than this current administration. This is something that's going back years uh, through multiple uh, presidencies. So just a couple of things that are worth pointing out here. Why in God's name would anybody pick September 11th for the date the pullout of Afghanistan, a conflict that was triggered by a terrorist attack on September 11th? Did nobody mention to Biden that that date was kind of important and you probably didn't want to paint yeah. targets on the backs of our soldiers for that? I, I could see the, the reason for going for it for like patriotic reasons because 9-11 is obviously like a very hot button topic for, you know, to stir up patriotism and fervor for that. And it being exactly 20 years, I could see him wanting. So you figured it would look better for us to tuck tail and run on the anniversary of September 11th. Well, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's it's not a good look either way. I mean, the, the optics there are terrible. Yeah. Like who's advising him on these things? <laughs> I mean, someone clearly must have mentioned to him that September 11th isn't the best time. So he pulled it back to August 31st, mm -hmm. which doing it in a shorter period of time, I don't think was really – a good idea. No, I think clearly if anything, it didn't work out. <laughs> no, clearly it didn't. I would have pushed that deadline a little bit further forward. But the other thing that's interesting here is they note that there's only 2,500 troops in country right now to do this evacuation. Now, this announcement came on April 14th. Why on, you know, August 1st, are there still people even in country? Because there are American civilians that are still in country. There was I saw one article in which there was a school trip. First of all, who the hell goes to Afghanistan on a school trip? What I mean, uh, like college or like high school? Or? I didn't read the oh, details okay. on it, but either way, I'm thinking that's a terrible senior trip yeah. at that point. <laughs> I mean, you need to talk to your your tour director right. or something there. <laughs> but why are people even in country at this point in time when the United States has announced a hard deadline for a pullout? Couldn't tell you. Honestly, it's maybe bureaucratic reasons, red tape, people can't get out. Uh, if they work with the embassy, maybe they're, it's a visa issue, getting out of country, um, global travel restrictions because of the pandemic. I don't know. These are, I'm just spitballing. And, and, and probably it's a combination of all of those, <clears throat> but it just seemed a little strange that we knew we were pulling out and we didn't do things to expedite right. that withdrawal of civilians. Yep. Um, and the fact that we've only got 2,500 troops in there who can't handle the security mm -hmm. of this withdrawal itself. They had a, a general on the news uh, just this week, and they asked him what he was going to do to help get Americans who aren't at the airport out of the country. And he basically came out and said, I don't have the resources to extend my operations outside the airport at this time to do rescue missions. So basically they're screwed. Mm -hmm. You know, you're, it's every man for himself. I can't even imagine what it's like for those people in the country. It, it must be terrifying. It's like the end of the world for them. Yeah, I, I agree. <clears throat> I saw a bunch of articles of, of the people in Afghanistan preparing for the Taliban takeover, and it's it's difficult to watch. You know, the, these people don't have a choice. They're just accepting that this is their new way of life, and it's, uh, and it's difficult for us to grasp. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, the fact that we're still there 10 years after we've achieved our goal of, I don't want to, I mean, we assassinated bin Laden. I mean, that's really what we did as a country. We assassinated this man. And we did that 10 years ago, and for some reason we're still there, and nobody can explain why we're still there. So something should have happened 10 years ago that we shouldn't even be there on Biden's watch. So I'm kind of hesitant to blame Biden for everything, especially given the deal that, that Trump had, had cut, basically. I mean, he, Trump cut a deal with terrorists, to hand the country over to him and didn't bother to ask the Afghans if that was okay with them. I mean, I, you know, and I don't want to get too political here, but I can't really expect a guy who's disloyal to his own country and tries to overthrow the government is going to be loyal, loyal to an allied government either. Yeah. So I'm not surprised by that. I'm surprised that the the United States was still bound by that agreement after he left office though. Yeah, I definitely think it's a, for me personally, it's definitely a bipartisan issue, and I, I know definitely there's a, a, a great deal of fault on Trump here, but I think there's a fault going back to Bush as well, Bush Jr., sure. then Obama continuing it with 
being determined to get bin Laden and now again Trump and then now Biden I think it it's a both parties have a significant amount of fault in this yeah you've got issue. four administrations two Republican two Democrat that are directly responsible for this catastrophe that's mm-hmm. in happening in Afghanistan right now yeah so so let's look at the immediate aftermath okay so it's estimated that as many as 15,000 Americans at the time of the writing of this which was a, a few days old now it's estimated that Ameri- as many as 15,000 Americans remain in Afghanistan after the Taliban's takeover of the country. More than 20,000 Afghans who aided the United States in the past 20 years qualified for special immigrant visas, but also remain in the country after the Taliban takeover. The United States military uh, inclu- officers, including Marine General Frank McKenzie have admitted lacking the resources to secure the perimeter around Kabul airport. He also emphasized, like I said, he did not have the resources to venture into the city to evacuate anyone or provide safe passage. The Taliban indicated they would allow foreigners access to the airport for evacuations, but new accounts suggest this isn't a policy that's being enforced with any level of consistency. Yeah, of course it's not. (laughs) Right. They're terrorists. What do you expect? Um, the Biden administration initially indicated there was no expectation of an imme- immediate takeover by the Taliban uh, after the U.S. pullout, which clearly wasn't the case. Mm-hmm. I mean, and we'll talk about why later. But whatever idea Biden had that the country was going to stand was completely wiped out within the first week of the pullout start. The U.S. has also trained and equipped more than 300,000 Afghan military personnel who were expected to maintain their territory and fend off the Taliban. And clearly they didn't. So some questions have to be asked. So with an announcement on April 14th of the firm deadline to pull out, why were there still so many Americans in country? We asked that. We don't have an answer. Why were qualifying visas for the allied Afghans not pre-processed before the withdrawal? You've basically painted the target on all their backs. Why didn't you ensure that you can get them out of the country first? No answer to that. Why was an evacuation of the Afghan allies not started before the withdrawal? You knew they were going to be the number one targets. Mm -hmm. There's lists of them already circulating circulating around within the Taliban who they want to. They're basically death lists. No answer to that. And finally, the next question is, why did the Afghan military fall so quickly and let the Taliban take over? That, to me, is probably the most significant question here. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. But what are your thoughts on this? Like, like, give me your thoughts. I I, I can't even formulate a question at this point in time. I'm so flabbergasted. It just seems awful (laughs) like i don't know how else to put it it just seems like a really unfortunate situation for those people and there's nothing it just seems like no one's coming to save them and that's awful and like like i don't know there's nothing you can do you know like and you look at some of the early images of the evacuation and you've got hundreds of people standing room only packed on the c-17s that are just astounding the pilots of the, the level of people. You had people climbing on planes, trying to hold on, falling yeah. to their deaths as these planes were taking yeah, off. That footage was, I don't know if uh, our listeners have seen it, but the footage of the people falling off the planes was uh, difficult to watch. Yeah. I mean, that's how desperate these people are. There's pictures of people on the perimeter of the airport handing their children up mm-hmm. to people over the wall to at least try to get these infants out of the country because they know they're not going to be able to get out of the country. And it's impossible not to compare it to the fall of Saigon, right? Oh, like the evacuation absolutely. of Saigon, people, you know, helicopters going down, people scrambling. It's What the, makes it not impossible to talk about that is because Biden said, you're not going to have another Saigon. Yeah. And then they, they did. And you do. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, the images of the fall of Saigon where helicopters are landing on the American embassy to get the last few people out. You have, <clears throat> there were accounts in during Vietnam that you had South Vietnamese pilots that were stealing aircraft, mm-hmm. evacuating their neighborhood. One particular pilot actually flew his entire family out to a ship that was waiting in the Tonkin, Gulf of Tonkin. And unloaded them 
hovering over the ship because the ship, the the mm-hmm. helicopter could not land. And then he had to ditch in the sea and be re- recovered. Yep. You're seeing that level of desperation now. Only you don't have all those outlets because you're in a landlocked country. Yeah. And the other countries, surrounding countries, are closing their borders down. They're not letting refugees out. And you've got the Taliban are not allowing Afghans out of the country at this point. It's a tragedy that should have been stopped 10 years ago. Should have never been started 20 years ago. Yeah, it's, and I, I said it before. It's like for these people, it's like the end of the world. Like there's nothing they can do. And it's yeah. for us in the comfort of our own homes to watch their worlds fall apart. It's, I don't know. It's. Yeah, I mean, life was difficult before in a war-torn country mm-hmm. that which Afghanistan's been for the last what forty years. But to lose everything, what little bit you might have accumulated, what roof you did have over your head, and then to be hunted down by this terroristic regime that is trying to impose a, a draconian system of law on you that you might not adhere to, believe in that the rest of the world doesn't adhere to it's, it's a tragedy that that's been long in the making, but it's one that, that we've contributed to as a country far too much. Mm-hmm. So we're going to take another quick break. We're going to come back and then we'll talk about what went wrong. What are some of the things that went wrong that we can immediately playing mon- Monday morning quarterback and talk about. <laughs> For seven years, the Second Sith Empire has been the premier community guild in the online game Star Wars The Old Republic. With hundreds of friendly and helpful active members, a weekly schedule of nightly events, annual guild meet and greets, and an active community both on the web and on Discord. The Second Sith Empire is more than your typical gaming group. We're family. Join us on the Star Forge server for nightly events such as operations, flashpoints, world boss hunts, Star Wars trivia, guild lottery, and much more. Visit us on the web today at www.thesecondsithempire.com. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Insights into Tomorrow, Battleground, Afghanistan. So taking a look uh, at what might have gone wrong or what did go wrong, uh, first looking at the country and its citizens. Countries have made the mistake of trying nation building in Afghanistan for over a 100 years. The Afghans are fiercely independent and incredibly resilient people. They're accustomed to enduring hardships after so many years. Uh, This is mostly or somewhat due to the harsh landscape makes unconventional warfare nearly impossible with its rugged mountains and lack of adequate infrastructure outside of the cities. A lot like Vietnam, except without the mountains. Ironic, isn't it? Yeah. It's uh, just cooler. So looking at the United States, primarily the result of an overall lack of guidance and strategy or objective to our presence in Afghanistan, uh, incompetence or ignorance on the part of the intelligence agencies. Um, As a side note to that, there's evidence that diplomats in country had warned the administration and intelligence establishments of the strong possibility of a rapid Afghan fall, which were ignored. Uh, Loss of interest in the conflict on the part of the American people. 20 years on, we thought we accomplished our primary objectives uh, with things like the death of Osama bin Laden. The war was extremely expensive. Casualty rates of any level were considered unacceptable. Uh, The lack of or prevention of further terrorist attacks put the original purpose of the mission uh, largely out of people's minds. So... You you mentioned briefly the parallels between this and Vietnam, and I think a lot of it th- – there's too many to not sort of dwell on, I guess, mm-hmm. here. Uh, so you have the, the country and its citizens. You know, So if you look at the hardships that the Afghans have dealt with in what's been a war-torn country for decades now, it's very similar to what the Vietnamese went through. Um, they were never a particularly prosperous or decadent country. Either of them were. So it's difficult for Americans to realize 
the hardships that they live with every day and the thought that that's something that would drive them to a, a peaceful resolution of things is is not even logical. Would you agree? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think it's it's such a different uh, way of life that I, I don't even think we can comprehend it. Yeah, and and you know, I draw, I kind of draw a parallel to movies like uh, Red Dawn, right? So you see a movie like Red Dawn where there's this theoretical invasion of the United States, and these high school kids, you know, change their way of life and go live in the in the mountains and. And, you know, my daddy taught me to hunt, so I'm going to go shoot bad guys and stuff like that. And it's a fantasy. Mm -hmm. Like, Americans can't even really empathize with that sort of picture. But that's how the Afghans have lived. You know, they've lived off the land. They live in harsh environments. They live in, in clans of warring tribesmen. Like, it's not... Like people look at a, at a modern country like the United States when you live here and you think, oh, well, you've got police and you've got low crime rate and oh, oh my goodness, the, the crime rate soaring and we've had 20 people shot. Well, 20 people shot here is an evening in Afghanistan sometimes when there's a raid. And it's like the, the standards that we live by here don't even compare to Afghanistan. And for us to think we're going to walk in there and impose our way of life on them is dangerously naive, I think. And yeah, and I think that's really the thing, right? These The people that live in these places were, I mean, if they, maybe not content, but they were, you know, alive and they were undisturbed. Right. I mean, sure, they had their own internal conflicts, but when we thrust them onto the world stage and make them part of our proxy wars... Things get a lot worse for them in the long run, almost 100% of the time. Yeah, and and the, one of the problems that we've run into is the, the proxy war that we have in Afghanistan. There's, like much like Vietnam, there's no clear objective. Mm -hmm. You know, in, in Vietnam, it was about numbers. The, the better numbers we could spin on the, new, the news each evening, the more domestic support <clears throat> you would get for the fight. Well, you weren't even getting that in Afghanistan. You know, you got to the point where the only thing that you saw in Afghanistan was when Americans were killed or maimed or whatever, or you saw the aftermath of soldiers that did their tours in Afghanistan and came back and had PTSD or were crippled or, or, or you know, partially paralyzed because of injuries sustained over there. And it became a very graphic representation of our presence in Afghanistan when there was no corroborating reason given by the government for us to be there. Yeah. And I think, it, you know, still comparing these, these two things, cause you just can't help it. Then it was a war on communism, right? And communism was a national, a global fear really, um, for everyone that wasn't a communist, but now it was the war on terror. And I think we're just subbing out these words, these, I like a war on an idea, right? And it makes it nebulous that you can do whatever you want. You don't have to make it a declared war. And I think that – I think the war on communism might have had a little bit more traction than the war on terror does now because terrorism, we can't – we don't seem to have a way to stop it, right? And right. Least, like with communism, you can sway the political leanings of a country. With terrorism, there's not a whole lot you can do. <laughs> well, and terrorism to a certain extent is a self-fulfilling prophecy. Why are there terrorists? Because they hate us. Why do they hate us? Because we interfere in their, yeah. their way of life. Yep. We impose our way of life in areas that, that don't want it. Mm -hmm. And as a result, terrorists rise up, insurrections rise up, they attack us, they fight you off, they, they commit to these asymmetric wars that we've never learned how to fight. You know, we've got special forces, you've got Green Berets and SEALs, and they can go in and do all this special stuff. But the United States as a military cannot fight a guerrilla war. They, they just... One, morally they can't do it because the bad guys do that, right? Mm -hmm. The bad guys are the guerrilla warfare guys. They're the ones that are going to go kill civilians to deter people from doing things. America can't do that. We never could do that. We've we just done use it. drones. <laughs> well, the problem is we've done that. Yeah. And whenever that's done, there's war crimes trials about that. So you don't – America doesn't want to be that that group. But if, if you're not going to play by the same rules as your opponent, you're never going to achieve victory. 
And if we're unwilling to play by those rules, which we should be unwilling to play by those rules, then you can't engage in that kind of warfare. I don't know. I think there's a decent argument to be made that drone strikes are our version of guerrilla warfare because we're taking, I mean, people, civilians die by the hundreds in those and the cost of those armaments, you know, I just think it's it's different than the boots on the ground approach where it's, you know, instead it's a plane taking out, you know, the amount of civilian, civilian casualties for one insurgent to be taken out is, you know. And that's a, that's a valid point. You know, when, when people see drone strikes, it's almost like a video game. Yeah. You know, you don't see Americans in there slaughtering women and children. You see a shot from 20,000 feet. You yep. see a brief flash and then you see an explosion. Mm -hmm. And it's almost a sanitizing way for us to do terrorist bombings. Yeah. That's a very good point. So the next uh, thing that went wrong here <laughs> is, is one that I think can't be ignored. And that's the Afghan military. <clears throat> I mean, let's face it. They collapsed like a cheap lawn chair. Maybe it was incompetence, indifference, cowardice, whatever it was it, that caused the Afghan armed forces to simply cave. We don't know what it was. But given the, the rate at which cities were being captured, I think you had a lot of Taliban sympathizers. The fact that the, the Afghan, Afghan government was relying on warlords in outlying districts to get their personal armies to defend the land. They're warlords. They're not government officials. Mm -hmm. So there's a profit to be made by doing what they do. And I would speculate that perhaps maybe they were bought off by the Taliban or Taliban promised them riches or lands or, or something, but Something caused the Afghan military to just collapse. A lot of the Biden administration's planning for this withdrawal was contingent upon the, Af the 300,000 Afghans that we trained and equipped to hold off the Taliban. And it never happened. It, was, it, wasn't, it wasn't even attempted by the Afghan military. And there's been no explanation as to why. So lack of a structured military control by the government and outlying regions was a problem with the Afghan military. Um, like I said, they were counting on regional warlords to defend the territory. There was a probably a fair amount of Taliban supporters already in the military. And some of the warlords were probably paid. You know, the government abandoned the country. The president was quick to flee the country to what he said, quote unquote, avoid bloodshed, which really was avoid his own bloodshed. Mm -hmm. Uh, this signaled an overall lack of effective leadership. There were signs of desperation early on as regional capitals fell. And it was, I mean, at least in Vietnam, the South Vietnamese put up a fight. Mm -hmm. And they put up a hell of a fight in Vietnam. They were overwhelmed. They were um, probably not confident enough or equipped enough to, to do what needed to be done. But... Once your air support dries up in most of these situations, you're going to lose land to a larger force. So the Afghan military is definitely to blame. <clears throat> but Joe Biden has to take some of the blame himself. We've talked about the fact that there's four administrations to blame here. Biden is one of them. Uh, he was certainly dealt a bad hand by the deal Trump struck with the Taliban. His intelligence agencies failed to plan for the contingency of the complete collapse of the Afghan military, which you would have thought you would have had reinforcements or at least airstrikes available to support them. Um, that overall lack of air support really killed any chance that the Afghans had of, of supporting it. It almost struck me as the Bay of Pigs invasion where uh, the United States trained up, the CIA trained up these Cuban refugees to send them over to, to uh, Cuba to invade, promised air support, and then none of it happened, and they all were captured. Uh, Biden has consistently dropped the ball when attempting to address these issues. Getting by on the fact that he's not Donald Trump just isn't cutting it anymore at this point. He's failed to properly plan. He's failed to properly lead. And he failed to provide remedies to resolve the issue. Now, a lot of people at this point in time are kind of jumping to conclusions and, and calling for his resignation. And, and I think that's grossly premature. Um, 
there have been a lot of mistakes made by presidents over the years, none of which are impeachable or worth resigning over. Uh, I don't think the Afghan withdrawal is one that that we should be demanding his resignation for. And there was reports that there were some Republicans that were preparing articles of impeachment, which, you know, given the political theater we went through during the Trump administration, I'm not surprised by that. Uh, but you know, Biden definitely did not was not doing his best during this. What do you think? Yeah, I definitely agree. Um, I do think that no matter who would have been president, someone was going to have to bite this bullet eventually. Um, <clears throat> if this withdrawal was ever going to actually happen, I don't think anybody, no matter who was in office, would have made this look like a victory. Um, just like in Vietnam, it was peace without their victory without defeat or something like that, or whatever we called our peace with honor. Yeah, that's what it was. Uh, so we can make ourselves feel better about it. But in this case, there isn't any of that. Um, I think he's, it's a really, really bad look for him as a president. Uh, we talked a little bit about it before the show, but the image where he's, uh, up on the podium sort of for his moment of silence, for his moment of silence shot. Yeah. I understand what he was going for in terms of wanting to be compassionate and, and, you know, those things. And I think that is important for a president to be, but I think people, his opponents, and even people that voted for him are already looking at him and seeing him as a as weak. And I think that this is a, definitely contributing to that image. And I think obviously there's lives being lost here, but I think for him as a president, he's really got to step up and and really look like a leader that the people that are still trapped in Afghanistan can hope and trust that they will actually receive some assistance. You're absolutely right. And I can't help but think – Regardless of, of who did the pullout, they were going to have a tragedy on their hands. Mm -hmm. it, it's something that should have happened after bin Laden was was assassinated. So you've had three presidents drop the ball so far on this. Biden, Biden really was the first one to say, all right, enough is enough. Let's, let's get this done now. So I have to give him some credit for having the intestinal fortitude to draw that line in the sand. So I gave him credit for that level of courage. I ding him on the competency in, in which he did it. There's some areas that need to be worked on, but I can't help but think how would Donald Trump have handled this? And, and the first thing that comes to mind was as soon as this became a graphical issue for him, an image issue for him, he would have said or done something else controversial to deflect away from this. And everyone would be talking about that. So you'd be talking about, immigration now or he'd be tear gassing protesters somewhere and, and and you wouldn't be thinking about this anymore and trump was a master at that trump was a master at taking bad press and then distracting you away from it and that's one area where biden is just not doing a very good job with it no we're just sort of wallowing in this yeah. unfortunate news cycle we're we're muddied down in the <clears throat> in this quagmire of of news now and the images keep flooding in and the terrorist attacks are going to keep happening at this point in time until we get everyone out of there. I hate to say it, but he could take a page out of Trump's book and learn how to distract a little bit from this. Smoke and mirrors did, did wonders for Trump. Mm -hmm. So we're going to take our last break. We're going to come back and we'll talk about what the future of Afghanistan and the United States looks like. We'll be right back. <music> Insights into Entertainment, a podcast series taking a deeper look into entertainment and media. Our husband and wife team of pop culture fanatics are exploring all things from music and movies to television and fandom. We'll look at the interesting and obscure entertainment news of the week. We'll talk about theme park and pop culture news. We'll give you the latest and greatest on pop culture conventions. We'll give you a deep dive into Disney, Star Wars, and much more. Check out our video episodes at youtube.com backslash insights into things. Our audio episodes at podcast.insightsintoentertainment.com or check us out on the web at insightsintothings.com.
Welcome back, everybody. We're going to take a look at the future of Afghanistan and the United States. So immediately, Afghanistan will once again fall under the oppressive regime of the Taliban. There will be no democratic system of government at all. Uh, the restoration of harsh Sharia law includes a body of religious rules to guide day-to-day -day lives of Muslims, a uh, stringent code of punishment, Islamic personal laws governing marriage, inheritance, and child custody, uh, a big emphasis on the uh, limited women's rights, uh, forced to wear head-to-toe face-covering garments, uh, beatings if they step outside without a, ma a male guardian, uh, no schooling at all, uh, public executions, whipping or stoning for the violating of the law. Um, there will also be economic sanctions. Uh, this is most likely going to be the next step from the U.S. in order to try to resolve the issue. This will also ultimately lead to hardship excuse me, uh, and deprivation for the citizens of Afghanistan. Ultimately, they will be the ones that suffer. This might even hamper international relief efforts and attempts to clean up the country uh, after 20 plus years of war, including the disposal of landmines. So, yeah, I mean, you're really seeing a country set up for um, hardship, more hardship than they've seen in the past from being war torn and from having an oppressive government. How do you think that's going to affect the rest of the world? I mean, I think it, it's definitely a, it's a bad look for the U.S. for sure. I mean, we're and people talk about you know the U.S. on the world stage embarrassing ourselves, and we definitely are. Um, and I think that you know economic sanctions are going to maybe make us look even worse because it's going to be ultimately the civilians that are going to be suffering from this. And I, it's just uh, we dropped the ball, and it's there's not a lot we can do. Yeah, and you're, you know, you're going to see that there's going to be extenuating circumstances to the pullout. You're going to see that the only thing the United States is going to be able to do is economic sanctions. Um, we don't want to stay mired up in this. you know. And the other thing that you're going to see come out of this is it's going to be a haven for terrorists. <coughs> Excuse me, again, you're going to see people, because of us trying to impose our will on another country, there's more hate. You're going to, I mean, you couldn't ask for a better recruiting pitch than, than the United States doing something like this. Yeah. Not to mention the, it's a win for the Taliban, right? Absolutely. So it's going to embolden any group in remotely like them. Right. You know, the Taliban have historically proven to be supportive of terrorist organizations and to a certain extent practice terroristic activities themselves. They terrorize their own people. Uh, you're going to see the rise of this, this ISIS-K movement that's responsible for these couple of bombings. Now, ISIS-K is an extremist branch of the Islamic State of uh, Iraq and the Levant. The K stands for uh, Khorasan, which is a historical province which once stretched across Afghanistan, Turkmenistan, Pakistan, and Iran. Uh, they've launched multiple attacks on refugees already at the airport and claimed credit for them in Kabul. They killed over 170 civilians and 13 service members, which is what the United States is reeling from right now. In retaliation to that, within the last 24 hours, the U.S. launched drone strikes. Again, our, our sanctioned form of car bombs, really, mm -hmm. at this point in time. They launched drone, drone strikes on the uh, Nangahar province in Afghanistan, targeting one of the suspected planners of the attacks. And the Taliban also have a history of supporting al-Qaeda. The Taliban already uh, sheltered Osama bin Laden during the American search for him after the 9-11 attacks. And the Afghan leaders, the current Afghan leaders, have made recent statements in support of bin Laden, raising questions of their continued support for the terrorist group. So they've pretty much signified the fact that they're going to be a home for terrorists. Anybody who wants to learn how to build bombs and kill people and terrorize the United States... You can come to Afghanistan. The Taliban's going to help you. That's what we have to deal with now. Yeah, and this speaks to the damage to America's reputation, which I already mentioned a little bit. Uh, this is going to weaken the United States uh, on the world stage. Our reputation with our allies is going to suffer when they see how poorly we treated our Afghani allies. Uh, we're creating yet another refugee crisis that the rest of the world will have to shoulder the burden of. Uh, speaking of refugee crisis, some of those refugees are arriving uh, in local military bases. Um where they're hopefully going to have some peace. Uh, the Afghan Civil War. It's hard to imagine this not ending with a bloody civil war among the Afghans. Uh, it wouldn't be the first or the last time. Uh, civil war is an opportunity to have a proxy war, which we already mentioned, between other less involved countries. Uh, ultimately, the region's going to continue to be war-torn 
for years to come. So, again, we're going to end the show on a positive note here, and it's doom and gloom again uh, for another region of the world. Uh, I think our involvement in Afghanistan is something that is going to cost us well beyond the numbers that we've talked about here for years to come. Uh, If you look just at the human toll here Mm -hmm. on the Americans that serve there, the, the people that that live there that are now displaced, the people that are living there now that are living under a repressive regime, um, 20 years later, nothing's changed. All that money spent, all those lives lost, all the bullets, all the bombs, and you're literally back to where you were 20 years ago. Was it worth it? No. (laughs) Uh, No, it wasn't. Yeah. Uh, for, for just for my closing thoughts, I'd say if, you know, you're going to take a look at this, try not to get mired in the, the, the teams of it. Don't take sides. It's, there's fault on, in terms of politics, fault on both sides. Uh, and ultimately the people that are losing are the people of Afghanistan and any other country that is caught in a situation like this. And the people that are winning are the people making money off of this, uh, follow the money, right? People that are making these drones, the missiles for the drone strikes, people that are funding these armies and, and profiting off any resources that are gathered in the process. I think that that is really the takeaway from this is that this is just the way that, you know, wars are go- going today. You know, the, the, the profiteering off it and ultimately the lower, you know, the less enfranchised people getting the hit. No doubt. No doubt. So that was all we had. Before we do go, uh, I would invite our audience once again to subscribe to the podcast. Audio versions can be found listed as insights into tomorrow. Video versions can be found listed as insights into things on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Stitcher, etc., etc. I would also invite you to write into us, give us your feedback. You can email us at comments at insights into things.com. You can find us on Twitter at insights underscore things. We do stream five days a week on Twitch at twitch.tv slash insights into things. We can be, uh, we can be found on Facebook at facebook.com slash insights into things podcast or Instagram listed at, at insights into things where links to all those can be found on our website at insights into things.com. That's it. Another one in the books. Bye everybody. Bye.